So welcome everyone to our HIPAA webinar with Josh Marpet. My name is David Sabo. I work for Virtual Security. I'm a VP of Developer Platform. And in this webinar for the next one hour today, we'd like to walk you through what is end-to-end -end encryption and how we use it with Twilio to allow early stage startups to be HIPAA compliant easier. Uh, that's that's the, uh, that's the brief summary of what we, we're going to uh, cover today. And uh, instead of a tech deep drive, uh, we, are going to, um, we are going to briefly walk you through Anton -end encryption and, and, and all the crypto and key management behind it, because it's essential for everybody to understand what is the tech that we are talking about here. And then in the second half or second 40 minutes of the webinar, Josh is going to walk us through the legal framework. How is encryption working in 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 the in HIPAA in the legal from a legal perspective um, yes so that's what we're going to cover uh, hey and thank you for for typing up messages in the chat window uh, now webinar is you know if you guys ever run webinars it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's it's a kind of an, it's an art um, to make it um, to uh, to to create a dialogue and, and make people chat and, and contribute. So we would love you guys to um, to type your thoughts into the chat window. Like if we are chatting, feel free to type messages anytime. Both Josh and I are keeping an eye on the on the chat window. Uh, if you guys have any questions, anything you'd like to hear us cover, uh, just type it up. That's that's the way to do it. Uh, from time to time, we'll stop and, and watch out for, for chats and ask your opinion. Um, yeah, so let me, uh, Josh, do you, uh, let me just uh, move next slide, yes. So this is uh, Josh Markman. Josh, do you want to give us a, a little intro of yourself and Red Lion? Uh, sure, I suppose so. Um, so I've got an intro slide in my group of slides, but I'll do it here too. Uh, Oh, dear Lord, I've been doing this for way too long. Uh, I am uh, information security for the last, uh, good Lord, way too many years. I'm, I'm not even going to talk about it, but I've been doing this a while. I've been doing computers for forever and a day since literally the, the 80s. Uh, yes, I'm that old. Thank you very much for reminding me. <laughs> uh, I've also done other stuff. I'm an ex-cop. I'm an ex-fireman. I'm an ex-blacksmith. Uh, I've lived an interesting life. Uh, I've hit some of my bucket point lists. Uh, ticked off world leader, check. You can actually, the picture that's on the screen now is me when I was being interviewed by, I think, NBC. Uh, yeah, NBC cool. 10 Philadelphia uh, about a Turkish case that I had to deal with. And it got really popular really fast. And I'm like, okay, you want to interview me? Fine. Uh -huh. But uh, I've, I've been around the block. I was at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. I've, I've done a lot. Um, I went through Mach 37, actually, with Virgil Security, uh, the founders of um, Wellman and uh, Dimitri Dane. Uh, good people. And um, like I said, I've done a lot. Now, Red Lion, my company, is uh, an information security consulting company. Uh, we do sort of your standard pen testing. We do your, your, your vulnerability assessments. We do all the things you'd expect an information security company to do. Uh, we also handle a lot of compliance work. That's actually more our specialty, to be honest with you. We handle working with companies to make sure that they're meeting the standards of what they're supposed to be doing. So we do the compliance work when it comes to cloud, when it comes to uh, healthcare, when it comes to, it doesn't really matter, uh, government work, FISMA, FedRAMP. Along with that come a lot of, uh, a lot of work. Um, HIPAA compliance as a service. So that was a question that's just asked, which company provides HIPAA compliance as a service, Virgil or Red Lion? Really both of them, to be honest with you. Uh, Virgil is the, the HIPAA compliance in terms of encryption and in terms of all the aspects of that. And we'll get into that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Red Lion is the one that comes along and checks your implementation of your other pieces of it. Encryption is a huge part of HIPAA, and we're going to go over that. We're, we're actually concentrating on that in this webinar for obvious reasons. Uh, but there's a lot of different pieces of it. So we'll be talking about that, but that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Uren, am I saying that right? I'm so sorry if I'm not. Uh, so go ahead, David. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, yeah, that's, and yeah, if, if you ever have a, um, a chance to speak with Josh, he has um, uh, a lot of good privacy stories to share um, oh dear. from all, over, all around the world. Uh, so, so about Virtual Security, we are an open source SDK. Uh, technically, that's what you got in your hands. Um, we are the tech behind Twilio's end-to-end -end encrypted messaging and chat. Um, and and this webinar will be all about that, how we enabled Twilio to serve 
uh, or, or, or Twilio's encrypted uh, chat and, or en and, en and encrypted messaging to, uh, to help early stage startups to be HIPAA compliant with minimal costs and work. And that's what we are going to cover in this webinar as, as an example. Um, we have a white paper um, that we can sh we, are, we will be very happy to share with you guys. Just uh, email me, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll also send you a link. Um, you can download the, the white paper from uh, Twilio's website. This white paper really walks you through all the technical details of what encryption we use and how, how it works and will also uh, send you two more documents to outline what you'll hear in this call today, outline the way that we de-identify data and how that approach works. Um, so as an intro of what end-to-end -end encryption is, I thought that um, I'll, um, uh, I'll give you guys uh, a, a quick run through of what end-to-end -end encryption is technically and, and, and how it can provide HIPAA compliance is, is gonna be Josh's um, uh, topic. For, uh, I'd like to start by saying that end-to-end encryption is not a fad anymore. It is here to stay. If you, look, it's true. Uh, if you look across all these companies, all the chat apps that uh, you may be using today, they're all end-to-end encrypted. And and chat is a real simple use case uh, because everybody uses it daily. It's all about our privacy, our private messages, and and stuff that we share with friends. This is the first big wave of applying end-to-end -end encryption and what's coming is not just chats and messaging but there's a bunch more stuff right now several companies we are working with several companies they are using our open source sdks to end-to-end -end encrypt patient data patient health records documents and a bunch of other stuff profile data in their mobile apps uh, because for a primary reason, they want to be HIPAA compliant or GDPR uh, uh, compliant. But then they have other reasons as well. They just don't want to see the data that they don't have to see. They don't want to see their users' private messages and private profile information, which isn't there for the, set, for the, for the vendor, for the app developer to see, but it's only there for the end users. The, and this brings me to what, what is a standard uh, how, how, how is your app using security? What is the, the standard internet security if you're using it today? This is how, how your app looks like today if you're not using end-to-end -end encryption. You are relying on two technologies for security. One is HTTPS between your mobile device and your cloud backend or your on-premises backend, or uh, sorry, web frontend servers. So first is HTTPS. Uh, and the second technology that your apps rely on is encryption at rest, which means that your backend database is encrypted with one single key. And that sing one single key is stored next to the database so that the database engine can load it in and decrypt the entire database file with it. If you look at these two technologies across all the use cases and all the things that are happening with, with, the, with your user's data, it's really a joke. But in contrast, end-to-end -end encryption is when we encrypt data on the mobile device, and then it will be the encrypted data that will go up to your web servers and it remains encrypted throughout that journey. And then your web server won't be able to see the data because it's encrypted on the client device, on the mobile device or in the browser. And then when your front end server writes that data into your da database, into a, into a specific field in your database, it still remains encrypted. So your database won't see that personal data either. And if your cloud service provider gets hacked or somebody has a malicious um, uh, reason to reach out your data, uh, it's still encrypted. And the encryption keys are held by these two users, one device and the other. That's what an end-to-end -end encryption key management is. And um, I'm not gonna cover um, the, how that works technically in, in details today. We are doing webinars weekly uh, to, to get you guys a better overview or a deeper overview of how that key management works. What you need to understand for this webinar today and what, what I wanna make sure that it's, it's coming through is that data is encrypted in the moment when it's typed in, when it's created, 
and it remains encrypted until somebody else, like a doctor, downloads that data on the doctor's device or in the doctor's browser, and data is decrypted on the devices, on the client devices. So data encrypted stored on the servers, servers databases know nothing about the data, and encryption keys remain with the end users. And what our SDK does and our backend ser uh, virtual services do is we do that key management to make sure that we, we do that key swapping and key exchange between the devices and the cloud without your backend services actually seeing it. The, um, this, this new way of thinking about encrypting data on the client devices really gives space for a, a whole new breed of apps. Uh, these guys, for example, are using, um, um, using uh, built an end-to-end encrypted chat for Capitol Hill and the White House. Uh, they, are, uh, they are the WhatsApp for, for the White House and Capitol Hill. They realize that WhatsApp is, uh, is not working in, in Capitol Hill because uh, anybody can sign up and there's no, no way for politicians to verify if they are actually speaking with with, with, with somebody else or speaking to with a stranger with a phone number. Um, so these guys built a, a, a WhatsApp for Capitol Hill, which actually verifies the geo perimeters of the actual buildings to make sure that people are there physically with a dot gov, uh, with a dot gov email address. So so they 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 really established that end to end encrypted democracy and and chat between uh, politicians in the White House. These guys in Germany, uh, Hassel Plattner Institute. Um, they are building their product right now. Uh, it's early stage, but they're building a healthcare platform for all German citizens uh, to protect healthcare records and health data with using end-to-end encryption. And, uh, and it's a health records management platform that is exclusively built for mobile apps. So if you build a health app today in Germany uh, that, uh, let's say, analyzes your uh, a patient's heart rate or that is providing a video consultancy to patients, that app can join into this platform and access that particular patient's end to an encrypted records. Actually, the patient gives out the keys technically to the app, uh, to the app developer to, to share those keys with, with doctors or with, with the consultants in there. It's end to an encrypted and zero knowledge encrypted. Also, uh, we are working with, uh, with uh, startups and, and larger companies in the IoT space where they don't just encrypt um, app data, but they also encrypt uh, sensory data. And this is, uh, this is particularly um, important in healthcare where there's a lot of medical devices. And so, so we work with Sora to, and this is a, an intelligent light bulb with a bunch of sensors, movement and sounds and, uh, uh, and light sensors, all, all kind of stuff. They end, end to encrypt that sensory data on this mini computer here uh, and then uh, decrypt it with the host device, uh, the bulb, and then uh, re-encrypt it end to end in the host device between the device and the cloud. So long story short, it's, it's Alexa uh, on steroids, it's the end to encrypted Alexa. So, so that's, that's, that's are the kind of um, new apps that are born out of this new world of end to end encryption, uh, where end to end encryption is really giving privacy and, and giving an approach, uh, a way to you guys app developers to not ask your end customers trust, but to, to put the trust into crypto and math. Uh, in, in one hand, and in the other hand, to make your HIPAA compliancy um, easier and simpler and faster. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Josh. Uh, so give me a second. Let me stop my screen share. Or, or stop share. And Josh, okay. it's over to you to do a sharing attempt. I think I can manage that. Let's see what <laughs> got here. Hang on one second. Okay, everybody should be seeing my screen, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So uh, again, I'm from Red Lion, redlion.io. And uh, what we're gonna talk about is HIPAA and EPHI. Now, if you don't know what EPHI is, that's fine. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, it's electronic personal health information. So let's, let's move forward and this is, just freeze it, there we go. Okay, 
<clears throat> that's me. And I, I gave a little bit about myself as well, but uh, already, but you know, th th these are things that I do. Occasionally I sleep. Uh, I run an information security conference, B Security B-Sides Delaware, uh, B-Sides DE. Uh, we're starting up an academic journal called the Synac Journal of Information Security. And I've been around the world and done all sorts of interesting and weird stuff. Okay. So let's talk about HIPAA. Now, now HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which is a huge long name for we want to take care of information. Well, what do you mean? Well, we want to make sure that information is being protected. Now, mind you, I need to talk about my pet peeve. My pet peeve is that HIPAA is spelled with two A's, not two P's. Okay, because whatever a HIPAA with two P's is, well, the only thing I can think of is a female hippo. Okay, so please, it's not two P's, it's two A's. This is health insurance, not hippos. Let's just be clear on that. I know it's funny. I apologize. It's just every time I see two P's, it's like, aha, nails on a chalkboard. Okay. <laughs> but at least we know that we are in the right meeting. We are not talking about hippos today. <laughs> if we're talking about hippos and encryption, we've got some very strange hippos, dude. Okay. <laughs> so let's move forward. So why is HIPAA around? And, and maybe you know this, and if you don't, you know, that's great. If you do know this, I apologize. Just bear with me for a minute. This is straight from HHS. This is one of their infographics. <coughs> and by the way, every, every picture I use is Creative Commons, and the only one that isn't, I will, I will uh, uh, I'm sorry, Rebecca, they're killing you. I apologize. I couldn't resist. I had to do this female hippo because I saw hippo with two Ps like six times in the last couple of days, and it finally was nails on a chalkboard enough that I added those slides. It's like, it's done. I'm, I'm talking about it. So, <laughs> so. HIPAA is there because people don't realize that their information is theirs. Uh, as we grow in technology, we realize that there's more and more and more information being collected about us, being collected for us, or being used against us. So we needed to be put in control of some of our own information. And that information that they started with, or the information we're talking about now rather, is health information. So if you didn't know this, you own your own health information. Every person, every group, every entity that has your health information has it because they have your permission. Well, I mean, if 41% of Americans, the one on the right, have never even seen their health information, how is it that they're giving permission? Every time you go to a doctor and you sign that HIPAA compliance form, you're giving them permission to keep your information. You're also giving them permission to send your information to anybody that needs it. Now, that's a little broad, and that's something we've got to watch out for. I'm actually that weirdo that reads those forms. I know, crazy, what can I say? But you have to watch out for where your information is going because sometimes, yeah, my insurance company gets it because they have to actually pay for the procedures. The doctors like to get paid. I know, I like to get paid. It's totally cool. So, but when they send it to the insurance companies, are they sending it there to be used for various reasons that I don't know about and don't approve of? Well, sometimes you gotta be careful with this stuff. So anyway, HIPAA was there so that you have the availability to get your information keep your information and own your information. So that's what we're talking about. Who owns this information, this electronic personal health information? Who has the rights to it? Now, you, of course, doctors, okay, I went to the doctor, he has the rights to keep his files, I'm totally cool with that. Health insurance companies, again, you know, they've gotta get paid, or they've got, excuse me, they've gotta pay the doctors, uh, I'm good with that. Third parties, should my health information go to some research group that is finding out stuff that might be used against me in the future? I, I want to be careful with that. I want to know positively. I want to, want to have positive control over my information. Okay. So how do you secure it? Well, understand what you're giving away. It's actually really simple. If you understand the forms that you fill out, if you understand, and basically it just means reading, the, the, the forms, the pieces, all, all the, the end user license agreements effectively to your own information, you can secure it effectively. But that's tough. I mean, I forget, As somebody estimated that if you read all of the end user license agreements that you saw during the course of a year, you'd waste like 150 hours doing it. Notice I use the term waste because, oh dear God, they're not fun. Does anybody remember that iTunes used to have a clause in there that you weren't allowed to use iTunes to make nuclear weapons? I mean, seriously? How much music do nuclear scientists listen to anyway? God. But, but if there's... If there's external methodologies, if there's things that are built into the systems that will help you secure your information because you can positively view every single person and entity that has a key to your information, like, I don't know, a decryption key, then you have a positive control and a lock on your information. And that's what this whole thing is about. We're looking at this not as a system to meet a compliance rule, which it is, 
but we're looking at this as a system to give positive control over your information or your client's information, or if you're a healthcare entity, over your patient's information. When the, I can't tell you how many healthcare entities I've been to and done audits of the records in prep for HHS audit coming in, and they don't even know who has access to it. Heck, a lot of times they don't even know where all of their health information is. They haven't even done a proper asset inventory. So again, this is a thing where whether, whether you're a covered entity, whether you're a business associate, whether you're a patient, whether you're whatever, these are ways to have positive control. And, and it sounds like, well, you know, if I'm a healthcare entity, why do I want to have, you know, something that, that controls even more? Because then when HHS OIG, the Office of Inspector General from Health and Human Services says, hey, knock, knock, we're here, you can give them a report. Here, here's every single entity that has access to the patients you've requested information on. Can you prove that? Yes, we can. And that makes life a lot easier. It makes audits a lot easier. It makes the time that you take on them a lot less. It saves a lot of budget. These are the reasons that we're talking about these things. Okay, and that's the reason we're all so incredibly uh, jazzed on encryption, all right, end-to-end -end encryption. So let's talk about that a little differently. Let's talk about why encryption, all right? And that goes to de-identification. De-identification is if I have information stored, let's just assume it's on a server, just bear with me, at rest and in transit, I know, but just for a minute, we've got information on a piece of paper, okay? And if, um, oh, good question. Rebecca, uh, how often does HHS do audits every year? Not of everybody, but every year they do audits. Is that something to worry about? If you're a covered entity, uh, which is a, a healthcare provider, okay, does that make sense? Uh, then HHS does and I apologize, I'm near the Naval Air Station Jacksonville, so you might hear the jet going by. But um, HHS does, I think, if I remember correctly, they've upped it this year to about 2,500 or 3,000 audits a year uh, of covered entities. Now, of course, there's, there's probably hundreds of thousands of covered entities in the U.S. So is that something you need to be worried about? Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like you're definitely going to get hit this year, but is it as rare as a lottery ticket? Oh, no. I mean, if we're talking 3,000, uh, I think it's 3,000, 3,000 out of, I don't know, 300,000, that's a, what is that, a 1% a, a chance? So does that mean, yeah, 3,000 out of 300,000 is a 1% chance. So does that mean in 100 years you might get audited? Well, no. Obviously, they're going to audit ones that worry them first, uh, that, that have puzzling or we're not sure why they're doing this or something's wrong there, something suspicious, if that makes sense. Uh, but on the other hand, they specifically do random audits. So while it's not the greatest chance that it's going to happen, it is something that could happen and you never know. <clears throat> and by the way, they're, they're going for more budget to do more audits next year because they want to make sure that uh, we all hear about Medicare fraud every year. We all hear about all the different frauds that are out there every year. Their goal, their job, their entire raison d'etre, the reason for being is to stop that fraud. And so they're going out there and doing a lot of audits. Uh, they're doing as many as they can actually physically do, and they're trying to do more and more and more every year. So while it may be a 1% chance this year, if it's a 5% chance next year, or a 3% chance, or a 10% chance, is it something you want to leave until it's too late? So that's, that's kind of where we are with that, if that makes sense. All right, so let's talk about de-identification. And I hope that answered your question, Rebecca. Uh, so let's talk about de-identification. De-identification is actually fairly straightforward. If I have information and I can't figure out who it is we're talking about, I have de-identified it, okay? That, it's really that simple. If you'll recall, I think it's like 10 years ago. Gosh, yeah, it is. I think it is about 10 years ago. AOL, yeah, definitely 10 years ago, released a whole batch of people's searches. And literally, this is what you typed into the search bar. Remember, AOL had a specific search bar. And uh, so they took 29,000 sets of searches, you know, one person and all the stuff that they, uh, uh, they did was a, a search, okay, or one, one, one record. And they put it out there for people to look at. And it was interesting because you could see what people were searching for. You could see what were common search terms. For, for a lot of e-commerce people, they, they used it to mine keywords and that kind of thing. And some people said, I wonder if we can find people from this. I wonder if we can backtrack from the search and actually find out who the specific person was. And they were able to do it. They did it for, uh, they, they took a sample of like a thousand of them and they found a couple of hundred people. That's a pretty good, you know, ratio there, okay? So, 
DA, so uh, HIPAA and HHS, excuse me, HHS for HIPAA said, we want that not to be able to happen. If you anonymize data for use in statistical reporting, very, very legitimate uses, you have to make sure that you cannot, de that you cannot identify it. You can't bring it back to a single person, okay? If you even have the data stored, I shouldn't be able to steal a laptop from somebody and look at the hard drive and they've got medical records on there. I shouldn't be able to tell who the medical records are. I shouldn't be able to get the, the information out of it. So there's two specific methods that you can de-identify data with. One, and it's on the screen right now, is you can take all of these pieces of data and uh, destroy them, change them to all zeros, uh, just get rid of them in the record, whatever. Or the other method, and I like this method, is the expert's eye. And that literally is you have an expert who looks at your encrypted data or your, your, your de-identified data and says, there's no way I'm getting that back. I cannot see anything in there that I can actually use, okay? Now, what's an expert? Well, that's actually up to uh, interpretation. There is guidance on it, uh, and as per the guidance, I, for example, qualify as an expert. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back that hard, I promise, but I've done forensics, I've done incident response, I've done uh, encryption, I've taught encryption at uh, college, university level. Uh, I, I'm not the only one, please understand, there's a lot of us out there, okay? But I, I do qualify as an expert. Uh, <clears throat> so what is the experts I looking for? And frankly, what are all these, these data elements, names, all geographic subdivisions, blah, 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 blah. How do we make sure that it's de-identified? Well, let's take a look. Okay. Encryption is the way that I prefer to do it. And, and, and the reason is it's actually fairly simple. Okay. You encrypt something and you're making it look like random noise. We'll get into that in a little bit, but is encryption the only way? No. As a matter of fact, encryption isn't even mandatory. Okay, and I'm not gonna read this to you, I promise, because it will bore the crud out of me. But the basics are, is that encryption is addressable. What does addressable mean? Addressable means that if you don't want to use encryption, you can do something else. You have to make sure it de-identifies the data. But, and you have to justify to HHS OIG specifications and satisfaction that what you're doing is as good or better than encryption. It's really that simple. But why would you do that if you can just encrypt the data? <laughs> Encryption is a mature technology. The, the encryption algorithms have been used for uh, quite a long time now. Uh, they keep getting updated so that we can make sure that the encryption is up to date and it's safe uh, and, and it, it works. So why would we do anything else? If you want to de-identify de the data and do something else, go to town. But I'd, I'd love to see how much time and effort it takes you rather than just make a few API calls, which Virgil makes possible, to actually encrypt your data like that. Okay? But don't take my word for it. All right, seriously, don't. I'll show you why. Let's look at data. Clear text, that's my name, there's a date of birth, and there's a social security number. Notice I don't say it's mine, there just is a date of birth and a social security number. I'm not saying they all correlate, but there you go. If you encode it in base 64 UTF-8, that's what it looks like, the second line, encoded text. If you look at the last set of lines, AES encrypted, that's what it looks like. You're like, well, they're both gibberish, Josh. What's the big deal? What's the difference, right? I mean, they both look like I, you couldn't get anything out of either of them, right? Could, can you find Joshua Marpet anywhere in there? No, of course not. Well, it's not entirely true. You can reverse encoding, okay? I, that's simply an online base 64 encoder decoder on the right, and I copied it. Let's take a look. Let's see if I can go back. Yep. TKFNRT, the first few letters of that, right? TKFNRT right at the top in the gray box, and then down at the bottom, Josh Marpet, DOB, SSN. Oh my goodness. Encoding is just like a, a decoder ring. If you're really old, like me, and you had a decoder ring, the letters were just simply encoded. You turned every A into an N. If you look down below, it's a really colorful hello. Hello, H goes to U, E turns to R, L turns to Y twice, and O turns to B, okay? So all they did was switch or substitute. This is just a letter substitution. Base 64 is a little more complex than that, but the basic idea is that it's reversible. Okay, it's really that simple. Now, that's understandable in a single illustration here, a single slide. Let's take a look at AES because obviously it's the same way, right? I mean, that's, yeah, what? <laughs> AES, this is from uh, Mouserware, M Moserware, I'm so sorry. They have a great comic. It is 20 or 30 pages long. I just snagged the crib sheet, okay? And they did a great job of it. This is how AES works. I will tell you right now, First off, there's a key that I use to encrypt my data into that, that actually, that, that slide. 
That is actually AES encrypted, the name, the DOB, and the SSN. I promise, okay? I used a key that I, I'm not, you know, it's not a big deal. It was just a string of, uh, it was a phrase. I forget what I used, Stormtroopers rule or something like that. And uh, I, it went through, I had it go through all of those steps to encrypt those letters and come up with that gibberish at the end. But this is not reversible. Without the key, which is something you keep very private, it is not reversible. It's just that simple. You can see how many steps it goes through. You can see how many rounds. How, it, it's crazy. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Throw them in the chat, please. Or does this make sense to everybody? And please, I'm not asking if, if the math on the screen makes sense. I'm asking if the idea of reversibility in coding versus encryption makes sense. And no, no questions. I'm going to be very annoyed. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Type it up. Type <laughs> it up, everybody. So please. Um, Makes sense. Okay, okay, okay. I'll let it go. Fine. Anybody, any, anybody, anybody wants uh, Josh to uh, to step back and and explain something, or should we proceed? I guess we'll keep going. <laughs> or they so can type this. Is, is that <laughs> encryption is non-reversible? Okay, which means that you can't reverse uh, the encrypted text unless you have the key. And there's a lot more complexity to that. But the idea is that encryption is very blatantly not only can you not see any, uh, uh, the actual data, the name, the DOB, the SSN in that data. I mean, let's take a look at it. If you can find, if you can find a, a name in K the whatever, I'd be impressed better I than I do. Okay. And you cannot reverse it and turn it back into that name, into that DOB, into that SSN. It's just not possible. Okay. So it's not reversible. It is de-identified and an expert says, I'm sorry, that's de-identified. There's no way to get it back unless you have the key. And those are the keys that David was talking about earlier, where at one end and at the other end, those keys are existence. I can encrypt it and decrypt it. I can encrypt it from the other side and decrypt it on the first side. But unless you have those keys, sorry, not happening. Okay. Uh, Philip, good question. Let's see. Is HHSOIG strict about the ciphers you use for encryption? This is a great question, Philip. Seeing that the NIST standards lag, do they allow you to leverage newer ciphers and hashes that haven't had the blessing from NIST yet? Wow, that's a really good question. So, okay, so I have, Philip, I'm sorry, that, that's great. Let me talk about this for a second. So uh, when you talk about ciphers, you're talking about algorithms. So the cipher, the, the encryption algorithm, uh, like AES-256, like uh, DES, triple DES, that kind of thing. Uh, remember, I said they get updated, right? And so what happens is, as time goes on, uh, the, the encryption ciphers, the encryption algorithms, uh, can sometimes be broken because we, we, uh, computers keep getting faster, keep getting smarter, keep getting better at doing math much, much faster. Uh, encryption, and this is a little deeper than I was planning on going, but it's cool. Encryption is not foolproof. Encryption is not my data is safe forever. Encryption is my data is safe for a certain amount of time. So in this case, encryption is with AES-256, my data is safe. At this point, we believe your data is safe for about a million and a half years. Probably by then, the fact that I had a cold or had my leg chopped off or, or, or whatever medical condition I have, I don't think anybody's going to care. I certainly won't in a million years, right? But, uh, you know, if you were using DES, for example, uh, right, Philip? If you're using DES, Data Encryption Standard, which was, uh, what, 20 years ago? Uh, it's an older, older, older standard. It's been broken. It's able to be broken fairly, I'm not going to say simply, but it's not like it takes years. It takes hours to days, uh, depending on what system you're using. Uh, and yeah, it still takes a pretty hefty, oomphy computer, but that's a lot easier now than it used to be 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? So the question is, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, as any government organization, they, they take time to come up with a consensus standard. So the newest cipher, the newest algorithm might be out and it might take NIST, I don't know, let's say a year or two, uh, Philip, am I way off there or does that make sense, uh, to actually get those algorithms into a NIST standard stating that these are uh, acceptable, usable, doable, right? Uh, so can you use those new standards if NIST hasn't officially blessed them? Does, does that make sense? And, and that's the question you're asking, Philip, right? Uh, do me a favor, just type in a yes or a no, just make sure that I'm not hallucinating. And, and Josh, while, while, while uh, Philip is typing it up, uh, let me also add that Please. 
if you are, um, and and I, I would suggest you guys do that. Uh, if uh, a couple of things uh, from the encryption perspective, we uh, a good and good encrypted system keeps revolving the keys, uh, the encryption keys. So you're not using the one key to encrypt everything for one patient, but you keep revolving that key. Maybe use a new key for each document, and then you keep a record of those keys. And our SDKs can do that. I'm happy to walk you through how we, how you do that with Virgil. That's one thing. And the second thing is. Um, uh, the second thing is, uh, even though you use an encryption that uh, allows you to comply with NIST, you can also encrypt that encrypted text one more time with, other, with another algorithm if you want. Um, so you can do the double Dutch approach and, and our open source SDKs allow you to plug in your own crypto libraries if you want to use something, something out of the default. So... Uh Philip, thank you. It's not a problem. I, 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 in, crypto is something of a, of a hobby of mine. I don't claim to be a cryptologist. Please understand, I'm not saying that. I enjoy the discussions of crypto. I enjoy the, the, the workflow. I enjoy the workflow discussions of crypto more than, um, more than the actual algorithm discussions, but that's fine. Um, and uh, Erin, that's a great question. We'll get to that in one second, okay? Erin asked a question as well. So Philip, let me finish up by stating that uh, you're right. SHA-1 is still blessed by NIST, and that might not be the best because there are collisions uh, in there. For, that's a hashing algorithm. But yeah, but I mean, um, the, the, the question is, you know, where do you go in that spectrum of it's so new that NIST hasn't even really gotten through it yet to it's so old, uh, but it's still in the, uh, the, 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 the standards because NIST hasn't gotten around to taking it out yet, right? And the answer is you probably shouldn't be using anything so new that it hasn't been fully uh, tested, fully audited, fully gone through. And so, and, and gotta, gotta, I got to give NIST real props here, okay? NIST and MITRE do a really good job of testing things. If you've never been to the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence they have, it's really good. They're actually seriously good people. I, I'm always impressed by the quality of the people they have. And, and I've, I've got to give them massive, massive props um, on that. I would say that your best bet is to use uh, for example, AS-256 is recognized and used by everybody. It is solid. Uh, if you want to go newer than that, I'd be really hesitant to until I know that it's been tested and audited by people I trust. And to be honest, NIST is one of the people that I trust, or, or entities, I shouldn't say people. Um, so I wouldn't go too new. It's always fun to test. It's always fun to play with. It's always cool to check out. Please don't get me wrong, and don't let me discourage you from that. When you've got a test system running, as we all should, and you do that stuff, always try it. I mean, it's always fun. And if you get to submit a bug report because you find some massively, massively nasty bit, that's fun. I'm sorry. I, I get a kick out of it. But I, I would stick with things that are, that, are, that are well within the boundaries of everybody knows it. Everybody likes it. It's been heavily tested. It's, it's accepted. Remember, this is not just for how technically can I be cool. This is also for liability, defensibility. This is for uh, uh, audits. And again, if you get an auditor who doesn't know about the newest, coolest uh, algorithm that you're using, you know, it could be a problem. They could go, well, I don't know this. I don't know that it's tested. I don't know that it's acceptable. We could have a problem here. Is that likely to happen? Not unless you have a breach. Uh, look, I'm not saying that encryption is the be all and end all. And David will never say that either. Remember, encryption is one piece of a larger puzzle. And as we do this, we need to go over all the pieces of that puzzle. We need to look at everything to make sure that you're done right. How many times have you heard about a breach, not because somebody did something technically wrong, but because their workflow was all screwed up? Okay, how often have you heard about somebody do something, uh, get breached or have a problem or lose money or whatever, because somebody found a, a bug in a web page that had nothing to do with the backend database? There's, again, encryption is one piece of a larger puzzle. It's an amazingly beautiful piece. It's elegant. It's lovely. It is, it is to me, uh, beautiful math. But uh, it, it's something you've got to be careful of and keep track of in the larger big picture scheme. Okay? I hope that makes sense. Now, let, let me go over to Ern's question. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to take that uh, if you want, Josh. Oh, please. Go right ahead. So, so there was a question from Ern. Uh, from a competitive st standpoint, how is Virgil and Redline different from other players like Aptible for digital health startups? So Aptible is, um, Aptible is a company that, that helps you secure, secure uh, your database. Um, if, if you look at database containers, encrypted disk, TLS uh, and endpoints, IPsec over VPN. Uh, so, so these are... 
uh, they're still still using the uh, the old the regular internet security. They are just trying to protect your data and give you compliance that way. What we are doing is um, we give you an SDK. We give you the tools so that your data won't need to be protected, but you will not even see the data. So you as, a, as the developer, you as the vendor for an app or for a healthcare service, you'll never see the data from uh, the particular data points from your patients that you don't want to see. And that's how you become HIPAA compliant by not storing that data, but only storing the encrypted form of the data and leaving the keys with your users. So in other words, if you, look at, uh, if you look at some of the security companies who do um, similar services like Aptable, they, they need, uh, the reason why they are a lot more expensive than, than, than end-to-end encryption will ever be is because they have a bunch of security guards and very strong security measures to protect data in the old fashioned way. Uh, of building firewalls and security guards and building security and stuff like that, where, well, end-to-end encryption is this new wave where your data is end-to-end is encrypted at the moment when the patient types it in or uploads it, uploads a photo of her health condition that is remaining encrypted forever until the doctor downloads it and you'll never be able to see it. The, 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 Major difference between the two is one is cheaper and the other one is more expensive because it needs a uh, lot more work. David, repeat the question. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'm still answering the previous one. And, um, and, uh, and, and the other is that if you are, and if you end to encrypt your data, your patient's data, you won't be able to breach it out even accidentally. So nice. while Aptable or AWS, even though you're doing your best job, may get hacked if, and to an encrypted data will never get out because you cannot breach it out. You don't have the data. And there's another question from, um, from Philip. How does Virgil's key management product differ from the KMS product offered by AWS and Google Cloud? The, the KMS products uh, in, in Google and AWS are built to, to manage keys in general, but not to manage keys in a way that you don't have access to them. So our, our end-to-end encrypted open source key management is totally client side and is totally associated with your end users on the devices in a way that you don't have access to those keys. You don't have access to, uh, to those keys on your backend while AWS does it in a way that you create the key and you distribute it to your users. You have a copy of that key for yourself versus we do the key management in a way that you guys will never have access to those keys on your backends, and we don't either. Hope that answers your question. Uh, Josh, over to you. We are 46 minutes past. Um, oh, dear. Um, so so let's, um, uh, let's, let's speed it up. There's you one more it. question from Philip, follow up on that one. Does Virgil's KMS support as, uh, asymmetric encryption and keys? Yes, uh, symmetric and asymmetric both. Yeah, they're, they're pretty flexible, let's put it that way. Um, so we've got, uh, I've got just a few slides left and I'll go through them as quickly as possible. How hard is it to be compliant and secure? Well, obviously it's incredible, yeah, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I had to do it, I'm sorry. I was having fun with this presentation. It is not that hard, I promise, okay? It is absolutely possible to be compliant and secure. Now, am I gonna tell you that you're gonna be 100% compliant, 100% secure, 100% everything? No. Absolutely not, because anybody that tells you that you're going to be 100% secure, laugh, kick them out of your office, and then walk away. Okay, it's not going to happen. There's always a problem with a user. There's always a problem with something. There's integrations between how many systems you're using now, 40, 50, 100, you never know. But we can get a, go really, really far. HIPAA compliance is not as complex as people think. It's not as difficult as people think, but sometimes it's not as simple. Yeah, it is confusing. Let's go over it really, really quickly, okay? HIPAA has self-audit tools. I cannot recommend the Baldridge Cybersecurity Excellence Builder enough. I cannot recommend the NIST CSF enough. They're not easy. They're not the easiest things to go through in the world. But the Baldridge Cybersecurity Excellence Builder is a great questionnaire that you actually give to the people doing the work, the practitioners. And it asks them, how confident are you that the people making the policy, setting the direction of the company, know what they're doing? 
and you get to figure out the self-confidence of your entire InfoSec and IT departments that way. It's going to help you understand the, the, the mood, if you will, the atmosphere in those departments. It's going to help you understand the confidence they have in their leadership. And the NIST cybersecurity framework is all about risk management. So you fill out a NIST cybersecurity framework and there are uh, profiles pre-built for healthcare and you're going to find out how well you're managing your risk. Are your policies written down? Are they codified? Are your policies sensible? Does everybody follow them? Is this, uh, you know, company wide or department wide or they're there and they're dusty in a file cabinet and nobody reads the suckers. Okay, then we can go over the audit protocols. There's a formal spreadsheet style audit protocol. It covers three main topics, privacy, security and breach. Okay. Privacy, well, it's pretty simple. Are you keeping the information private? And that's where the end to end encryption comes in. Okay, as well as security, by the way. And, and then breach. Well, breach is, is what happens if. It's, it's the what ifs, all right? Now, there's about 170, actually, they just revised it in April of last year, no, June of last year, sorry. So there might be 190 now, I forget, but it's a questionnaire. You filled out compliance questionnaires before. You filled out supplier or customer or somebody's compliance questionnaires. It's exactly the same way. You go, yes, we have, the, you know, they, they ask a question. Do you have a policy stating that access, you know, remote access via VPN has to be controlled? Yes, we do. You know, prove it. Okay, here's my policy. If you can get through that, you're a long way to knowing how compliant you are. If you can't, you've got an automatic, at least half of your gap analysis is done. Okay, so should you do this alone? I mean, this is the practical questions. The answer is sure. Are you a tiny little doctor's office? Are you one doctor, five doctors? Are you a, a, a lawyer's office? And by the way, if you're a personal injury lawyer, you are covered under HIPAA. You must have HIPAA compliance. This is, you have a business associate agreement, BAA, you've probably heard that before. <clears throat> you must be HIPAA compliant. There, there's no, there's no he, like, like hemming and hawing. There is absolutely no leeway. You must be HIPAA compliant. Can you do this alone? A lot of HIPAA is policy-based. If you have policy, if you have the systems to do these things, if you have all the, the, the documentation, you're probably in good shape. Go through the audit protocol spreadsheet. I highly recommend it. Go through it as if it was a questionnaire from a supplier, from a client, from a whatever. And if you find out that you've got most of everything covered, well, now you've got a few holes you've got to fill. If you're larger than that, if you're 20 doctors, if you're more than 20 million a year, more than 50 million a year, somewhere in there, more than that, you absolutely should bring in an expert. You should bring in an expert firm. You should bring in an expert person. You should have a compliance department working on it or have them bring in external consultants. It should be done because frankly, there's a couple of reasons. One, HIPAA has no certification. There is no certification. And anybody that tells you, oh, high trust does it, they're wrong. Say it right to their face, they're wrong. Because high trust specifically says, this does not mean that you are HIPAA compliant. Different words, but you get the idea. If you get high trust certified, it means that you're certified by high trust. HHS does not recognize that as HIPAA certification. Okay. I'm not saying they're bad. They're not. They do some amazing work, but it is not actually certifying you as HIPAA compliant. So should you bring in a high trust expert? That's up to you. Should you bring in a company like, and I'll be honest, shameless plug, Red Lion? Sure. That's fine. We, we, we don't mind business. We kind of like it. It's, it's a nice thing for us on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and I'm joking about the expert wearing a top hat. I actually wear one on a daily basis. I thought there would be a camera here. I'm wearing it now. But irrespectively, the, the point is, is that you have to determine how far off are you from the mark, from where we want to be. If you're not sure how to determine that, if you're not sure if you can determine that, or if you're just having real problems with it, yeah, bring in an expert. You need them to sit down with you and with external eyes, with, with a fresh pair of eyes and with a fresh understanding of HIPAA, let's go through it all. Let's figure it all out. Okay. Does that make sense? Good. Because literally it's not that hard as long as you know what you're doing. So we wanted to say thank you. And uh, David and Virgil Security decided that saying thank you is a really appropriate thing to do. So David, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. All yours, David. David? You're here. Sorry, sorry. I, okay. uh, it's difficult defining the, <laughs> the unmute button. Uh, thank you, Josh. So uh, here is, uh, let me just take you back. Share screen, I guess. And I'm just going to share uh, just a couple of my slides. Um, i just disclose this. So, uh, uh, Josh, is it coming through my screen? Yes, absolutely. I can see your screen. Awesome. Uh, cool. So 
in the, in summary, um, if you look at standard app security and you guys are all in the middle, that's your app backend. If you're looking at standard app security with HTTP and at rest encryption, you are here in the middle and you are fighting hard and, or, or your, the, the providers that you're working with are doing, it's, it's a really hard job to go through every single point of HIPAA and protect the data to be compliant and safe. While if you are doing this way, you are still in the middle and you're not seeing the healthcare data. And that's, that's the approach that Twilio has taken with us. So I would encourage you guys to, to keep it simple, do it this way. And uh, the, your job is not, not even going to be just simpler of not needing to do all that HIPAA work here on your backhand but you're gonna actually protect your data, your users and users and patients' data from a potential breach. So you're not just gonna be HIPAA compliant simpler, but you won't be able to accidentally breach out data, which is another layer, if you think about it. Uh, I also wanted to show you, uh, this is uh, just to give you a sense of how difficult uh, or easy it is to implement end-to-end -end encryption in your app. Um, this is uh, a new landing page about uh, the, our Twilio and to encrypted chat app. So if you are like any other healthcare startup, you need a chat in your app. So here are three steps uh, how you do this. This is two users chatting. And, and we'll have more technical webinars um, if you guys want to join and learn how to get started. This is uh, when, you, when we create a user key. This is all running on the device or in the browser in JavaScript or in Swift or Java uh, and iOS and Android. This is all client side code on the device. We create a key for Alice. We protect that key uh, on the device. And then the second, is, uh, the second step is when you wanna send a message or encrypt a document uh, that you want somebody else to access it. You, this is a message here right now, a chat message you encrypt, you sign and encrypt that piece of text and then you use Twilio uh, to send it over or you would just write it into your database. And then the third step is that other person on the other side of the chat will get the data and will decrypt it with his own private key. It's this simple, this many lines of code to build that end-to-end -end encryption into your app and work like this. And then you don't have to worry about all that stuff. What do you do with the data when you have it? What happens if it breaches out? Um, this is our pricing. Uh, do you are free to start um, uh, in, in our basic plan. It's good for up to 250 users. Then we go to production. Uh, we charge you guys $49 a month for up to 2,500 users. And we have a special offer up till the end of, uh, end of April. If you sign up for a business plan um, today, we'll not just uh, help you get started in a, in a red carpet way to implement your end-to-end -end encrypted app, but uh, we'll also give you two hours free uh, HIPAA consultancy. Um, so, with us. <laughs> yeah, with, with Josh and Josh and the gang. Um, so if you guys decide to, uh, to take advantage of this offer, email me and uh, you'll see my email address in this slide. And if you email me, I'm also happy to share you our Twilio white paper and a brief of how that de-identification works that Josh talked to you about. What is the legal framework be behind end-to-end -end encryption used for HIPAA? And then we also have an expert opinion uh, from Josh. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you so much for all the good questions and for showing up on today's webinar. Uh, have you guys joined our Slack yet? If you have not, um, definitely do. Uh, in a follow-up message, I'll send you a link that you can use to join our Slack workspace. I also wanted to, yeah, just give you an overview into, uh, uh, sorry, not this one, give you an overview into, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a quite avid uh, Slack channel, a channel by now. We have a, a lot of developers talking about technical topics here. here. We recently created um, a channel for, uh, for FERPA, GDPR, and HIPAA. You can ask questions here, and Josh will answer uh, your questions. And uh, 
we are also doing uh, webinars weekly to get to help you get started uh, with uh, either through our partners if you guys are using Twilio and Exmo or these these good companies uh, you have an easier job to implement end-to-end -end encryption in your app or if you want to implement it yourself we can uh, we can always hop on a call and help you get started this is my email address dave at virgilsecurity.com thank you again for your attention and looking forward to helping you guys be HIPAA compliant simpler And oh, we we'll email you the Slack link. <laughs> yes, I'll email you, uh, email you all the Slack link, and uh, I'll just look at the chat if there's any more any more question. What is the Slack link again? I'll just uh, type it up here. Here you go. This is the Slack link. If you guys want to join our Slack right now, uh, just click it, and you'll join. And that's, yeah, thank you, Jaws. That's our email address is, I think, J Marpit. Uh, that's your Slack user ID, right? And my Slack user ID is yep. Dave. Uh, Philip, I'm so happy. I'm, I'm glad you got something out of this. Uh, I hope you all did. Um, you know, we, we tried to keep this not horribly salesy. We try to keep this where it's informative, where it's understandable, where you're going to get some useful information out of it and get a chance to ask some good questions. Uh, really, really hope that it, uh, that it worked out and you guys enjoyed it and, and got some useful stuff out of it. And remember, there's a free gift. Sign up for that Virgil business plan until April 30th and get a couple hours of free. Well, you can do HIPAA or if you're doing GDPR or if you're doing FISMA. We, we handle most every different compliance bit out there. So, yeah, but uh, please feel free, sign up for the business plan, at least start with the basic. It's incredibly useful. Uh, they've had developers sign up and be actually encrypting their data within, I think it was like 30 minutes. It was ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, sign up for a plan. If you move it up later, you, 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 you know, you email David, go, hey, hey, I moved it up to business. I really want to get that to us consultancy. I think you might be able to persuade him. So. <laughs> But of course. sign up for a plan, get rolling with this. It's the best way to make sure your data is safe, to make sure your data is protected, to make sure you're compliant. Encryption is in so many different compliance, compliance regimes, it's not even funny. All right? So sign up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to speaking with you. Bye.